Um, as I said before, my name is Pavitra Abraham. Um, I am so excited to be with you all today to moderate uh, this closing out panel for the day, Home Stretch Success uh, for GOTV. Um, what we're going to do, I want to talk a little bit about our, our run of show, introduce our panelists, and then we're going to jump right in. Um, so what we're going to do today is we are going to talk through um, what it means to be successful during GOTV. We've got some expert panelists with us today um, who have done many a GOTV in their, in their day um, and are going to help us kind of troubleshoot and think through some of the common mistakes that that tend to happen, right, and, and um, help you all think through some of the best practices. Um, we will also take questions from all of you. Um, so feel free to put, go ahead and put those in the chat. I'll be keeping an eye on it. And so um, will the rest of our, our training team. So we're going to kind of alternate between uh, the questions that we've got and some of the questions that, that you all um, are going to ask. So feel free to just put those in the chat. Um, and we will keep an eye on it, um, but I'm really excited. So really quick, just to do intros, as I said, I'm Pavitra, um, I use she, her pronouns. I currently work as the National Organizing Director um, with the DCCC, um, but before that have bounced around on campaigns uh, and got to work with NDTC for a couple of years um, when I was living in Chicago. So really, really honored and thrilled to get to be part of today's session. Um, I wanna introduce our panelists. Okay, so we've got Jess, Jess Cruz, um, former training director with the Florida Democratic Party and Florida Coordinated Campaign. Um, she has done a bunch of amazing things, um, worked at Emily's List um, in 2018, trained thousands of women um, on how to run for office through their one, Run to Win program. Um, she ran ca a campaign in 2017 in San Antonio, um, worked in Virginia Beach, helped flip the House of Delegates there, great. Uh, Jess is originally from California, went to Trinity University um, and is one of our NDTC trainers. All right. Okay, we're gonna go to Jordan. Jordan Berg Powers, the one and only um, ED at Mass Alliance. Um, more than a decade of experience helping elect new progressive leaders um, across the state. Um, helping folks run and training grassroots organizers. Um, in 2015, Jordan was recognized for his exceptional work in politics as an inaugural inductee to the 40 Under 40 um, Poly Award. Um, and so we are so thrilled to have him with us today. He conducts trainings across the state on understanding government, advocating for issues, grassroots campaigning, messaging, and political power. Also repping our wonderful Build Blue Week t-shirt today. Um, so we love to see that. Uh, yes. All right. And then last but not least, we've got Sarah Joy Pearson, also an NDTC trainer. Um, more than six years of organizing digital and tra training and GOTV experience. Most recently was deputy organizing director for the Georgia Senate runoff. I don't know if y'all know, but we won. That was awesome. Uh, Deputy GOTV director on Pennsylvania's coordinated campaign um, helped us take back the Senate and the White House. Um, Sarah Joy believes in investing in future generations of organizing and has helped train, that, train thousands of organizers as a lead coach with the organizing corps. Um, when she isn't working, I love this, when she isn't working campaigns, you can catch her traveling the country in her Subaru and camper. Very, very fun. Um, okay, so that's our, those are our people. Um, really thrilled to be with you all today. So I'm going to go ahead and jump into our first question. And Jess, I'm going to kick it over you to you to get to get us started. Um, would love to hear a little bit about the, the biggest mistake you see campaigns making um, when choosing how to spend their time in the final weeks of, the, of their campaign. Yeah, uh, thank you so much. I'm so happy to be here. I did the math today. I've done six GOTVs over the course of like four years. Um, so this is my favorite time of year. Happy to be here. Um, when it comes to the biggest mistake that I've seen folks make in the really short time of GOTV, it's not prioritizing direct voter contact. The things like canvassing when you can, phone banking, text banking, like these are the things that you're actually going to mobilize voters to go to the polls, to send in that vote by mail ballot, to go early vote. Like those are actionable things that you can do to make sure that you get the votes in and you win on election day. Um, but I think we've often seen like your volunteers might really wanna to put together yard signs instead of going to a canvassing shift. They might think that visibility on a street corner, um, making sure that folks honk when they see your signs is 
a great way to get voters to the polls. But from what we've seen from past campaigns, it's not it's not necessarily the best use of your time. And you want to make sure you're doing things that are effective and the most efficient things that you can do in that final time. Yeah, that's super smart. Sarah Joy, I saw you nodding along about the yard signs. Do you have any thoughts or feelings you wanted to share on that? Not to put you on the spot. Um, specifically about yard signs, no. Um, <laughs> but um, I think one of the biggest mistakes that we make here in the final few weeks is um, just like not spending enough time with staff and volunteers to really train them on expectations of what the final few weeks will look like. Um, I think knowing that a well-executed GOTV can like really make the difference in these tight races, it's just like all the more important to make sure that we have like trained our staff well, trained our volunteers well, and like made that investment. Yeah, that's great. This is a totally a time to showcase all the work um, you've done to date. Jordan, anything from you on this? Yeah, there's a couple of things I want to add, although I just want to highlight yes to absolute yes to Jess and what Sarah uh, Joy said. Both of those are a thousand percent correct. Um, the only other thing I would add is just don't let the enemy of the perfect be the enemy of the good. So a lot of times campaigns will say, well, we can't do door knock everybody, so let's do something else. You know, focus on the places where you know you can get some extra turnout, focus on what you can do. A lot of times we think because we can't do the full thing, we don't bother. Um, you know, really dig in and do what you can do. And that goes back to the other thing. My other piece of advice is always take some time to do some retrospective about what you've learned through your doors, through your campaign at this point. It's worth the extra time to get a better sense of are our assumptions correct about who our voters are, who we might need to pull out extra, where we can put extra bodies or extra people into. So just take the time to make sure that you've done a little bit of research on what you've learned in your campaign. Yeah, yeah, that's great. Be, be reflective right? Learn from the things you're doing. Um, a really good question in the chat that I think is relevant here that I want to uplift. Um, so Steve, thank you for this. Talking about how Virginia now has 45 days of voting, which is awesome, um, but so do many states, right? Many, many states have um, really comprehensive early voting plans, uh, early voting um, setups, which means that you can do a deep dive on GOTV, right? I'm curious for our panelists, what have you seen as some best practices for running a 45-day or 30-day GOTV? If you don't mind, me, me hop, okay. Yeah, um, go for I, it. I just wrapped um, a Virginia primary, which was where we had that long um, stretch of time. So I think when you're looking at something that's longer than your traditional two weeks, one, you're able to employ a ton more tactics. Like you can do your texting, your phone banking, your canvassing, but you can also make sure you're being strategic. Knowing if you're getting vote by mail ballots that are dropping in mailboxes, are you reaching out to those voters that you know are requesting their ballot that you need to chase them a little earlier than other folks? Um, whether that's mail, canvassing, texting, phone banking, but it, this long time gives you the ability to talk to more people and be a little bit more thoughtful of how you're talking to them. Yeah, Jordan, did you have something on that? Yeah, uh, that's really fantastic. I was gonna say the same thing about using some of more of the tactics that we sometimes don't have time for, thinking about can we deploy digital, email, other pieces that we don't often think about for GOTV because we don't have time to do it, to start deploying some of those things. Um, and additionally, that's a good time if you have partners in your area or organizations. I, you know, A lot of times we take for granted that they're on the same calendar as us, but we should make sure that they're also thinking about GOTV. They're also thinking about how they can get some of their people. I can't tell you how many times We've done, you know, taken that time to um, for partner organizations who can dive deep into some communities of color, communities that are um, unlikely voters. They have that extra time. If you really get them geared up, they can have those connections that a campaign doesn't have the ability to turn out that they might be able to turn out. So I tend to also remind them because they're not, you know, they're not necessarily political organizations. They're not necessarily people who understand that timeline or opportunities that are there. And I try to work with them to bring them into that process to see if we can get squeeze every vote we can in that little bit of time. Yeah, yeah. Um, I know folks are still still putting stuff in the chat. So I have a question actually. Um, thinking about GOTV, right, and and um, just the pure madness that it is, how do you, for, you know, all of our panelists have been through many a GOTV, right? What is the best way to prepare folks 
who are first time GOTBers? What do you, what do we tell them? How do we get them ready for what is going to be just a bananas couple of weeks? Sarah Joy, anything? Let's start with you on that. Yeah, I think um, I actually just joined the GOTD team in Virginia. So um, we just went through our GOTD trainings and I think um, context is just super important. So I think being able to break down the big picture and show volunteers and show first time organizers, whomever, um, really what their contribution looks like and what it means on the bigger scale. So um, I think just like making sure to break that down um, so they understand what their contribution looks like and like what the final few weeks will really be for them. Yeah, that's great, Jess. Anything on that, Jess? Yeah, I think the, the one thing I wanted to add is when you're sort of preparing people, you also, it helps to give like upfront examples. Like in the past, I've seen this happen. Um, really preparing people to be flexible, be prepared for what, what could happen. Um, in Virginia, no one told me that buses could come down from DC and really flood a staging location um, for canvassing. But if I had known a bus was coming in 2017, I would have been a little bit more prepared um, when 60 people showed up with pizza. Yep. So keeping in mind that like, it's really helpful. To, you can't prepare for every scenario, but give examples that could sort of span what may or may not happen. Yeah, yeah, that's exactly right, Jordan. Um, I just try to remind people that this is the easiest part of the campaign. So now's your time to join. Like I really try to, you know, all the people who are scared to plug in all the times that people are like, I don't know if I can door knock. I'm like, this is the time for your first door knock, because these are people, these are great conversations. These are easier conversations. So I try to just prepare, I try to use that as an opportunity to get my first timers in as well, or those reluctant people, those people who are like, no, I just want to stand around. I'm like, well, now's the time to do something useful. Um, you can really dive in, knock some doors, make some phone calls. These are these are people who are we know are with us or should be with us, and we're going to have great conversations with them. So I like to just use this opportunity to get those last folks in to the volunteers. Yeah, yeah. The the urgency doesn't get any higher, right? Uh, than when we're recruiting for GOTV and when we're in that final stretch. That's right. So another question is, what should people expect on election day? Candidates, staff, what do you expect on election day? It's kind of a trick question because I'll say the first time I had, you know, as a staffer on election day, I had, I thought I was like having a stroke, truly. So how do you avoid that feeling amongst <laughs> candidates and staff? Um, Jordan, I'm going to you. Uh I, you know, I think I, I tell people to get um, going out of business sale. Like it's, it's a really good time to just, everything's got to go. So rather than thinking of that chaos as chaos, I think of it as like, great, everything's got to go. Like everything, it doesn't matter. Like it's going to be fine because we have this end date um, that we are going to start. Uh, that's this, you know, everything ends at this time. So everything we do is fine. So just like, go, go, go. And just have that attitude of like, it's going to be okay because this ends at this time. So I really try to have that focus for people and not try to feel overwhelming. Um, the other piece of advice I just give real quick to candidates is I tell them their work is done. So like, you just got to stay sane and out of the way. So whatever it is that they need to stay sane and out of the way, like I have had candidates like drink on the couch. I've had candidates go to the movies, like, if they can be helpful, fantastic. Love candidates who can be helpful, but not everybody can be helpful on election day. I was just on an election day um, last Tuesday where my candidate was having a moment uh, and just, I was like, you stay home now. <laughs> like you just, you don't get in the way. We're going to, we're going to get them through. And we did like, you know, we had the volunteers, the campaign manager had the things to make it, to get it through. So um, it's okay to be emotional on election day. It's okay for your candidate to be overwhelmed. It's a lot. It's a lot. So just like do what you can and be kind to be kind to that person. But everybody else, like go, go, go. <laughs> yeah, I love that. Jess? Yeah, in sort of the same vein as Jordan, I talk about it being organized chaos. Like you've made your plan. So now it's just executing everything that's going to look chaotic, but in a way it all has purpose. Um, but I also try to remind, remind folks like you're going all day but you still need to make it to tomorrow. So please like drink water, eat snacks. We need you for the next fight for the next election too. Like it does, uh, the campaign itself ends on election day, but the fight and the movement continues on. Um, so keep in mind, like you can't just burn yourself out and be done with one campaign. 
Yeah, I want to double click on something just just said, right? Which is like, this one election is going to happen. Election day is coming. And I think oftentimes as organizers and as campaign staff and candidates, we tell ourselves, oh, I can do anything for 30 days, right? Which is true, sure. But you don't need to, right? Also, your life is going to continue after those 30 days, right? Hopefully, theoretically. And so thinking through how do we create the best plan to scale in the ways that we need to, but also not totally um, lose our minds and, and, and set ourselves up to not be able to do this work anymore. That's really smart. Um, Sarah Joy, election day. Election day, I think, is it like a really special time because everything you've done for the past few months has like built up to this moment and really like you get to see all of the systems that you put into place, like either help you be really successful um, and, you know, hopefully at this point you've worked out all of the kinks and those things. And so I think it's just really like a neat time because all of these systems are running um, and like all of your work for months is just like really being seen. But um, I think it's just like a good time to celebrate what all has been built. And I, yeah, I think I agree with everything that Jess said too about making sure that you can still wake up the next day and do this again. Yeah. And in some cases, waking up the next day and doing it again is a must, right? You might be entering a recount, right? Things may not be uh, done, right? So making sure that your team um, is, is set up is set up with them. Yeah. Um, cool. I also want to uplift that um, election day, if you've done your job correctly, is probably going to be a pretty quiet day, right? And that's a good thing. Right. If your election day is a quiet day, that means there aren't little fires that you have to put out. It means you're not running around uh, feeling, you know, nuts. Um, so don't I, I know that like that has certainly caught me off guard where I've been like, do what do I do right now? Right. Um, that's a good thing. And don't let that uh, uh, catch you off guard. Um, OK, so I want to move to our next question. Yes. And thank you, Maggie, for, for calling that out. Um, for all of us to make sure that we're saying our uh, saying acronyms um, out loud, what they actually stand for. So um, GOTV here is obviously get out the vote, um, but we'll make sure to keep um, keep keep that uh, in mind. Thank you. Okay, what are some of the best tactics to focus on when time is so short until election day? Um, can we start with you, Jess? Yeah, I, I think I might repeat a little bit about what I said earlier, but the most important thing to do when time is short is to focus on your direct voter contact. Some folks call it DVC. Make sure you're, you're canvassing when you can. Um, phone banking being really big during the times of COVID. Um, texting if your campaign has a texting program um, and being sure that you're training your volunteers to be able to do that really efficiently and so that they, they don't uh, make some large mistakes like putting lit in a mailbox. Like it's still important as we're going and going during GOTV to train your volunteers to do direct voter contact. Yeah, spot on. Um, Sarah Joy, anything on this? Yeah, I think best tactics, I think, especially in the final weeks, I think it's really about two buckets. Um, one being voter education and thinking about Virginia, for example, um, there's a lot that we can do around voter ed um, because early voting started yesterday. Um, no excuse, early voting is new in Virginia. So there's just a huge opportunity for the campaign to reach out to voters and start banking votes now. But that can only really happen if voters know that early vote is available to them. Um, and while we're doing this like voter education, it's also really important that we're helping um, voters make a plan to actually get to their to get their ballots in. Um, so yeah, I think it's those buckets. And then while you're like navigating those things, you're still doing a lot of GOTV recruitment, get out the vote recruitment to make sure you have volunteers coming in um, to also support those conversations that you're having. Um, so yeah, I think it's just really important to have strong voter education um, and mobilization happening at the same time. That's awesome, Jordan, yeah. I just wanna um, echo what Jess said about uh, doors. Uh, 
they are just so critical. And, you know, they, we, their study after study shows that they are the best way to get people to go to the polls, old fashioned 18th century technology, just going to talk to people and having a conversation and say, we need, you know, please go make a plan to go vote. Um, so I just wanted to highlight uh, that again. And I just want to, you know, some of the other things that I've, um, you know, help to be helpful is to walk people through the process themselves. So not just the pro, you know, ensure that they know what is available to them, especially as states open up all of these new opportunities, ensure that they know what's what they can and cannot do. But I also let my good voters, the people who are supporting us know why we need them to vote early. You know, I let them know, hey, if we can get you to vote early, that enables us to focus our last couple of days or our day on those folks who we're not sure are gonna go vote and we need to go vote to win. So I also let them in on our strategies for GOTV. I try to bring them along in that process so that we can clear out those good voters. Like there are plenty of good voters who are older voters who are like, I just wanna vote on election day. And I just say like, if you can vote early, that would help us win. Like, you know, I just tell them that and I let them know because if we can clear out good voters and have just those folks who are harder to reach, harder to get, harder to convince, we can we can ensure that our efforts are on those people in those closing moments, those closing days, we're all gonna be better off. So I let, I let our folks know exactly what the plan is um, as well as all of their options that are available. And I do that by door knocking and, fo and, and phone calls. <laughs> yeah, all that's, all oh, that's exactly exactly right. Um, and and you know to to kind of summarize everyone's point, right? The once you're at GOTV, you are really coming up against the clock, right? So you are constantly faced with that decision of what is the best use of my time or what is the best use of the candidate's time. And to everybody's point, it is going to be talking to voters that need that extra push. Something I love doing during GOTV, especially during early vote, is telling people, if you go vote, we will stop calling you. The best way to get off our lists, right, is to vote. Because once you vote, we love you, we appreciate you, but we don't care anymore, right? Um, so I think just being upfront, letting people in, you know, to that insider baseball of, we're going to call you until you vote. I have a great story for that. So I- please. Um, I, there's only one time I ever finished a list, like everybody on my list went and voted in all the years I've been doing this. And I remember it was like 730. And I was literally just sitting across the street from this poor man's house waiting for him to come home. And he came home and I was like, hi, my name's Jordan. I'm here to encourage you to vote. He's like, I just got home. I don't know if it's gonna be worth it. And I was like, every other name on this list is crossed out. I'm going to sit here and bother you until you go vote till eight o'clock. If you and I walk right now to the polls, it's right around the corner, I'm going to be happy. You won't hear from me again. And he was like, all right, man. <laughs> um, That's exactly so, it. Yeah, I, I think like reminding people that like the sooner you vote, the sooner you'll stop hearing from me is one of the best ways to get people to go vote. Yeah, the sooner I will leave your literal porch. Yeah, yeah, I love that. I love that. Um, I want to kind of talk about this, uh, you know, focusing on tactics. What about folks that live in, um, more red areas or more rural districts where there just are fewer Democrats or there are fewer volunteers. Um, how do you suggest going about recruitment in those areas and, and still having the conversations you need? Um, let's go with Jess. Yeah, I, I think you start um, looking for volunteers in these red areas and sort of your, your typical groups looking on Facebook if you have um, a state or a county party group, um, indivisibles, um, all of those sort of like regional places that can support um, democratic candidates and campaigns. And then from there, really doing like relational organizing, right? Like you have your base of volunteers, have them reach out to people they know, have them reach out to people and really build your network of people. And I think in a way that applies to voters as well. You can start with relational organizing to really lock in the folks um, who will be your base in those red districts. Yeah. Yeah. The, the only other thing I would add, and I just want to echo what Jess said, um, is start early. So, you know, mm. recruitment doesn't start two weeks, four weeks out. It starts as soon as you start your campaign, reminding people that you're going to need them most. Tuesday is a weird day. They might need to take off work. Um, you know, if you uh, they probably will have to take off work. If they have six months to plan that out, you know, then you need to ask six months in advance. 
Um, so ensure that you're making those asks early on. And the other is just if there's a university around, see if there's some young people um, and do the same thing that Jess just mentioned. You want, that you want to have those relationships, see if there's organizations. So just echo what Jess said. Yeah, yeah, that's great. Um, okay, we've got a couple of questions um, in the chat. So one of our attendees is talking about motivating volunteers, right? So um, or, organized a ton of folks for the Biden campaign, had a conversation with them before election day, um, and, and talked about how a lot of people maybe see this, see election day as a, a stop sign, right? It's like when things are, are done. How do you suggest we go about motivating volunteers to, to stay involved? Sarah Joy, do you want to maybe start here? Yeah, I mean, this makes me think a lot about Virginia because we went and had such a big election last year. Um, a lot of us then went to Georgia to help with the Senate races. And then um, here we are in Virginia with a really important race, um, especially with our House of Delegates down ballot. So I think that one way to motivate is just by like reminding volunteers the work that we've done and like the success that we've seen. Um, but we've only like made it this far because of organizing and good organizing and, um, you know, building on that. So, yeah, I think it's just, and I think that there is like a really important piece of training when we are getting them involved in big years, like 2020 to remind them, like, we are training you like this and like making sure that we're developing you because we need you involved in 2021. And like this infrastructure is really important, um, moving forward. Yeah. Anything, Jordan? Yeah. I'll just say, you know, ensure don't just ask for things that are tough on the campaign. Um, have some joy as well. So, you know, anything you can do to have a party afterwards, invest in people, um, give people opportunities for development to get some, um, you know, to grow their leadership, to move themselves up a ladder if they'd like. And there's like plenty of resources on ladder of engagement at NDTC. So, um, you know, all the things that you can do to sort of keep people involved is give them more responsibility and bring joy, give people chances to, to have joyful moments that aren't just like, we gotta run, we gotta run, we gotta run, like give people other things. Yeah, I think, um, I think, I think that's great. And one of the things, you know, I, I talked about this earlier in one of my sessions, but um, so many of us got our start by volunteering on campaigns, right? Um, and it's because those experiences were great and were awesome and were empowering and filled with joy, right? That we stayed in the work. And so one of the biggest things that I would say about motivating volunteers is just prioritizing them, right? Um, and, and helping them see the long game. Right, we say this every cycle. Every cycle is the most important election of our lifetime. That's going to be it's every election, right? Um, and there's going to come a point where we need other people to take the reins, right? And so, um, helping them see that context, right? Of if we hold the house this uh, upcoming uh, November, or I'm sorry, next November, great. But we've got to keep the White House in 24. Right. So it's just it, it all builds on each other. So um, I think that's that's super smart. Jordan, thank you for that. Um, OK, how do you know this may be more of a tactical question? Um, so whoever wants to dig into van, how do you know if someone's already early voted? Who wants to do it? Jess, you were smiling and laughing, so it's you. <laughs> well, I think it might depend uh, state by state of what goes into your your van, like in Virginia. Um, I believe the party like drops it every week. So you can actually look in people's records of like they've requested their ballot, they've voted early, um, but you might need to request that information from your secretary of state or your county clerk, whoever's in charge of your elections in your district. Yeah, the biggest tactical piece I'll say on that for everybody is that it is different state by state. So figure out early, uh, build relationships early with the county clerk, with the state party, with the secretary of state, whoever it is, right? So that you know when updates are going to happen and can hold them accountable. And you can call and say, hey, you said I was going to have this update today. It's not updated, right? Um, so, but all of that is uh, should live in, in the voter file um, or get pushed to the voter file with some amount of, of frequency. Um, okay. I just want to add something to that just to say Please. real quick. Um, find out who the people are and, um, you know, 
become friends with the people who are in charge of those things. So I will tell you, I'm a very confrontational person. And, uh, I didn't, uh, but all of the city, cl- all of the clerks in our area are, I'm like friends with their, all the folks because they have access to information I need. And, um, so, you know, and they, and there is laws that govern it, but there's some, you know, there's some wiggle room, how quickly, how much they do all the other stuff. And so, um, yeah, find out who those people are and be nice to them. <laughs> well, I just say bear hug them, you know, give them a big I mean, bear you know, hug and never should, let them go. As, yeah. as long as they're okay with it, you should ask them first. Right, but. right. <laughs> exactly. Make sure they're okay. Metaphorically. Uh, Yes. You know? Yeah. Yeah. But I am always just like, oh, you know, it's so tough. And in my mind, I'm like, everything you're doing is illegal and wrong, but I just need this thing from you. So. Yeah. <laughs> you're like, I'll do whatever, please. Yep. Yeah. Just be nice. Um, a, a great question from Alonzo. How do you, how does voter suppression impact GOTV? How would you handle this strategically in swing states or purple states? It's huge. Anyone want to take a, take, First run at it. I mean, I guess I'll say the first thing is just know the rules. Yeah. Um, you know, they have yet to stop us from a lot totally from voting. So while we have still access to that, find out what the rules are. Um, let voters, you know, let your volunteers first and foremost make train them, train them, train them. I think Jess has said this now several times, and same with Sarah Joy, like train them, train them, train them. Let them know all the rules, make sure they know them upwards and backwards. That they, you know, if you do it right, every single person who leads the campaign could be a mini, a lawyer on this stuff. Um, so let them know exactly what the rules are for every place you are, and then you know, do the best you can to push through. Ultimately. They have to allow us to, they, you know, they got to allow us to vote. And so do what you can to maximize those abilities to, you know, to, to manage based on the rules. And they are varied state by state um, and so forth. So whatever the rules are, just, you know, work around it. Um, you know, I, I'll just say real quick, I'm, I'm in Massachusetts and, you know, I tell people all the time that Massachusetts voting laws are as hard as they get pushed, they've been pushed back into other places. So um, it is as difficult to vote in Massachusetts in many ways as it is to some of these states that have taken away abilities. Like we've never had like vote, we don't have vote by mail, we don't have um, all night voting, we don't have drive up voting, we don't like we don't have any of those things, but we still get people to go vote. So, you know, do what you can around the laws, push as hard as you can, and let your volunteers know what you need to do. Um, Sir Joy, did you see anything with this, just with all the madness that was voting in November um, in Georgia? Like, how did you all think about navigating all the changes? Um, I think Georgia was just, yes, we did see it in Georgia. So um, I think the best thing was just, make, again, like making sure our staff and our volunteers really understood what was going on, what um, the landscape looked like for each of their counties, what our relationships were with um, Board of Elections, things like that. So that way, like, you know, if we needed to move quickly or have conversations with some of these Board of Elections, um, it, the, the organizers on the ground and the volunteers on the ground knew that someone else was going to handle that. And we had lawyers on call to like support that work. Um, but yeah, I think that this is a good question and really challenging for sure. Yeah. Um, I think, yeah, just to echo Jordan, right. Um, the biggest thing to do here is just know the rules so you can plan for them. Right. There is a lot that's going to happen during GOTV that you are not ready for. Right. There's nothing you could have done to prepare for X scenario. Right. Unfortunately. So making sure that all the things you can cover, um, are covered is going to be a huge, a huge part of this. Um, which is actually a good segue to our next question. What are some of the biggest unknown variables to account for in your GOTV planning? So many. <laughs> uh, unknown variables. Jess, let's start with you. Uh, the first one that com- comes to mind in unknown variables that I don't think you can necessarily plan for in your GOTV plan is weather on election day. Volunteers don't want to go out in the rain. Voters don't necessarily want to stand out um, going into a polling location in the rain. Um, but on the flip side of that, things you can sort of plan for, flake rate in volunteers. Um, I've seen volunteers who are really pumped to go out and phone bank or, or canvas, 
but then a candidate from the statewide comes in with a rally and they decide to go that way. Sometimes can't always plan when advance and um, the folks that plan events are gonna come into your, your city, but being prepared with uh, recruiting more volunteers than you need um, so that you can account for that flake rate is really important in your GOTV plan. Yeah, that's great. Um, Jordan, unknown variables. There's, um, I don't, I'm worried to say that there aren't many left at this point, but I feel like, cause there's so many things that have happened, but over the years, I'd say the biggest one that I come across is something wrong with voting. So yeah. a machine is down or, um, you know, or somebody's, uh, uh, you know, a, a warden is doing something that they shouldn't be doing. Um, I don't know, something like that, yeah. where it's just on where you're trying to work with somebody. So uh, the thing I always see is I always have a suit on election day. I play, I, re I play a really good lawyer. I happen to know all the laws. So I intimidate people. Um, and I just come in like, you know, that's when I come in hot and I'm just like, y'all break the law, I'm gonna sue. And then they're like, oh, you know, so, uh, but have somebody who either have lawyers <laughs> or have somebody who could play one on TV. Um, and, uh, those things come up and just like, try to get a, try to get it fixed as quickly as possible. Yeah. And if you, and, and know ahead of time who you're going to call. So in every scenario where there's a legal prop legal thing, I have probably seven or eight individual slash levels of people I could call from city clerks to state officials, to national officials, to lawyers, that local lawyers, I have state lawyers, I have national lawyers on call. And I wanna be prepared for anything that might come up um, so that, you know, and I, I usually call, I usually call them one-on-one -on -one, uh, leading up, weeks leading up to it. And I'll say, I hope I don't have to make this call on election day, but I want you yeah. to know that this is my number in case you've missed it the last two years. I'm, and, you know, I may, I may avail myself of your services on election day right? Are you still the person? Is there somebody else, right? So you line up the legal things you need, um, over-prepare like you would volunteers. Yeah, that's right. Sarah Joy, anything wacky that we should know? I, yeah, this is like a bringing up so many memories, but um, right. it's okay. I think that what's really important here is just knowing like a million different things can happen on election day. Um, and you can try to be as prepared as possible for all of the things that could fall. But I think what's really important is just making sure that your systems have been tested and that like everything that you have built, um, having confidence in that so that when there are things that come up and, you know, small disasters happen, um, your whole organization doesn't break. Um, yeah. So I think that it's just important to lean on those. Yeah. I just want to say one more that um, that I've thought of since then. So have paper backups to your mm. to your list. I, I can't like that's the I was trying to think like what's the one thing that has almost broken our GOTV? And I was like, oh, when Van went down, <laughs> yeah. and we were all like, what? Right? Like <laughs> so um, so I so now I almost always have paper backups of my lists of my phone calls so that should anything happen, we can we can go through it. Because um, most of the things that feel like biggest disasters ever are minimal and things that take a, like maybe 20 minutes, half hour to fix. Like there are things that you can manage around if you're calm in that moment. But that was the one thing where we were all just looking at each other. So what do you want to do, right? Because yeah. that was the backbone to our bit thing. So now I have paper. Now, <laughs> there you go. Now you have paper. Um, no, I think that that's, that's great. Um, the biggest thing I'll say is that there's going to be stuff you can't prepare for, but just knowing to Jordan's point, knowing who to call, right? Your job and, and in any of our roles, right? It's not to be able to solve every single problem ourselves. It's to, it's our job is to know who to call, right? So the, whether that's a lawyer, whether that's a county clerk, whether that's a head volunteer, whether that's the candidate, whether that's your comms person to say, you know, the New York Times just showed up, I don't know what's going on, right? Um, hopefully it doesn't happen, or maybe hopefully it does. Just knowing that you need to call, right? Uh, the other thing I'll say is it's obviously much easier said than done, but when it comes to election day and GOTV, your job, the best thing you can do for your team is to be cool, right? Be cool, be calm. Everyone is going to take in your energy and your vibe. And if you are frantic, people are going to think something's wrong, right? So um, that's one thing that I would make sure that no matter what's going on, van breaks, you know, it's like, cool, let's go to paper, you know? Um, so just keep that in mind. Okay. Um, I want to ask about, hold on, I'm moving my questions around. Okay. So how do you know 
when to switch from persuasion um, from persuasion to mobilization? When do you advise people to do that? And how do you know that you're ready to make that programmatic switch? Sarah Joy, you can Jordan, yeah, please. Um, okay, well, I'll Jordan, just say, yeah. um, <clears throat> for me, it's when, when, I'm, when I have enough votes or close to election day. Like for me, I, when I'm, and this comes up a lot on the campaigns I'm advising, I push persuasion until I think I can win. Like, I just think, you know, we got to win. We got to make sure we have enough people. Um, you know, if the, you know, if the tactic that we're deploying to win our campaign is to ensure that Democrats get out and we, and we don't have enough for that, then that means that you need to switch over, right? Because then the important thing then is to ensure that Democrats get out, but it's about having enough votes to win. So that's the that's the guide star. Your vote goal is your guide star for me, at least, in making that decision. And how are we? What's our plan? What did we plan when it was quiet and easy and not chaotic? When did we? What did we plan? What do we know we needed to win on election day? Which is why we plan backwards. And that's when you decide. To, that's for me when I advise candidates to switch over. So I'll ask them a question: Are we? Do you have enough votes to win? No. Have you talked to enough voters? The answer usually is no. So that's what we're usually doing. If, and if it's if it's yes, and I'm not sure there's enough people yet, okay, well then we need to switch to GOTV because we need to ensure that we get out some more voters. We got to figure out where our voters are coming from, right? And so that's when I that may be when I make the switch over. So, but it's about vote goal for me. Yeah, Jess. Um, I think now with COVID-19, you also have to consider expanded vote by mail and early mm. vote. So um, the most recent campaign I did, we also did sort of a hybrid where we were still persuading voters uh, to turn out to vote, but we had gotten some of our, we had a GOTV universe, we knew folks who were turning out to vote for us, so we were mobilizing them at the same time, and that came down to like layering tactics, so again, canvassing, phone banking, texting, which I say on repeat, um, but also like our mail and digital to make sure that we were both continuing to identify more voters that were supporting us and turning out the people that we had, because we didn't want to end up chasing them after they had already sent their vote by mail ballot in. So it is possible to do a sort of hybrid. Yeah, super smart. Sarah Joy. Um, I think what Jess and Jordan said here, um, one thing that they both touched on is just that this is really dependent on program and like the program that you're running. Um, so I don't think that there's a hard deadline that you should ever set for yourself on this. This is so dependent on where you are and what things look like um, and decisions should really be made on that, I think, based off of those numbers. Yeah, that's exactly right. Um, and you know, a question that we, that we get all the time is like, um, okay, am I supposed to stop doing persuasion? Like now do I stop? And it, the answer is no, right? You do persuasion for as long as you need to do persuasion. That could be literally up until election day, right? Hopefully not, but we've seen it done and, and people will, that may be a real thing, right? So ideally in a perfect world, in a vacuum, you can do your persuasion, you're all good, and then you can move straight to mobilization, but that's not how anything works, right? So um, thinking that that phase, that persuasion phase has to stop is, is totally false and you should be doing that as long as, as, long as you need to. Um, okay, another fun question, I think, I mean, they're all fun, but another question before I think we go to our last, our last question. So Jordan, you kind of shared about Van going down. Jess or Sarah Joy, anybody, do either of you or Jordan have another example of a time where you've had to like immediately adapt something in the moment uh, for GOTV? Emergency GOTVs, Jess is like, yep, I sure do. Yeah. Uh, it, it was Florida 2020, a, a fun time for us all. Um, but through talk went down, which is like a predictive dialer, essentially volunteers are on the phone and the dialer makes calls for you, so you just have to talk to the voter. Um, but through talk completely shut down. We had had issues with through talk before, so we knew it was possible given the volume of volunteers. So our digital team and our field team had actually prepared call sheets ahead of time, and we had sort of been practicing with our dry runs to use um, BPB Connect, which is essentially vote builders or vans like dialer itself. So we had practice with our volunteers using different tools so that when we had to make this switch because something went down, we could just switch our volunteers over and we didn't lose too much time um, talking to voters in that like very critical few hours of election day. So it, again, it comes back to training your volunteers and being prepared for every scenario. Yeah. And keeping it cool. Like I can't imagine, right? You're all sitting here in the state of Florida, massive, huge, right? 
all of a sudden, thousands of volunteers are like, we can't make phone calls, right? Um, so hats off for being prepared for that. But yeah, the, you know, things are going to happen. Sarah Joy. Actually, the hub dialer was also the thing that came to mind, Jess. So um, I think that that was a big part of 2020 and my memories there for things switching over. Um, but also I had a time in 2018 where um, it was Connor Lamb's special election, and I was launching from Pitt's campus to help get students out to knock. And I swear, like, it hailed that day. It snowed that day. Then we had, like, beautiful moments of, like, sun. It was, like, it was brutal. And um, I think just, like, really trying to switch and keep the students motivated while we were doing that was, like, a pretty hard election day, um, especially knowing that we were likely going into – a recount or our team had to wake up the next day and um, collect signatures to get Connor on the ballot for um, the coming uh, general election. So it was just, I think, just knowing like we had planned for a really strong GOTV. We were excited to be in election day, um, could not change the weather that was happening, um, but could just like try to like keep ourselves moving, um, and understand the goal. And we, we, you know, I really believe those conversations that day were powerful and important because we won by 627 votes. So. Yes. Yes. Uh, right. So I, um, I'm, I'm very old, so I won't say what year this was, uh, but it was a long time ago in elections when I was still working in Pennsylvania. And, um, one of the things that happens, uh, that will, that could happen, especially if you're in a swing district or a swing time is, uh, we were, we were doing the GOTV and we were hearing complaints that they were, people were just being overwhelmed. And we found out that there were about 40 canvassers doing an IE in one part of our district. And we were, and we were just hitting the same doors and it was a waste of resources and you can't coordinate that. So for those of you who don't know, an IE is an independent expenditure. And that means that people were door knocking, but they can't talk to the campaign by law. And so they were, um, and because this was such a big election, they had recruited a lot of volunteers for a critical part of our district. So we immediately took all of our volunteers off of that area and redeployed them to some other places and ended up being great for us because we knew that they were going to cover a critical part and we could redeploy to some of our secondary targets. We had secondary targets in place, we, we had actually a list of every part of the district by order of like, if we could send more and more volunteers, where would they go? But that might be something, especially if you're working in a really important race or important part of a swing state and a swing district, um, people might come in and start running and you, you have to be able to figure out what they're doing and judge accordingly to make sure that you're not overlapping too much, especially if they've got a cover, which in that case they did. Yeah, yeah, there you go. Um, I'll share my story quick and then we're going to go to our closing, our closing piece. So, um, I was, this was in 2012, um, and we were doing, um, door hangers for election day. Um, but, you know, those of that have dealt with door hangers, you know, God bless. Um, so doing door hangers, they were, this was the Obama reelect. So we had more money than we knew what to do with. And, uh, the, your polling location was printed on, uh, the actual door hanger course, easy. So we can go around, we can hang it on people's doors, polls open at seven, here's where you go. Well, of course, several polling locations changed. Um, and we didn't know till the last minute. So not only had we hung, not only did we have the door hangers, we had hung them and they were wrong. So we had to very quickly figure out how to run around town and remove the door hangers if they hadn't been collected or try to get a hold of those people and say, we left you the wrong thing or leave a, a makeup door hanger. It was really a mess. Uh, but to Jordan's point about, you know, redeploying capacity, we basically had a couple of precincts that were doing really, really well. Um, we had like knocked the hell out of them, right? So we moved our canvassing teams from those precincts uh, and said, we need you to go to these neighborhoods and pull down door hangers and have as many conversations as you can. Um, it was bananas, uh, but yeah, it was so stressful and terrible and uh, potentially illegal to tell people the wrong polling location. Um, but yeah, we, re we had capacity, folks were excited to have a role and be asked to do something and, and you know, we sent them out to, to fix that. So, you know, things are gonna happen and y'all are gonna be ready to, to do it. Um, okay, so our closing, question um, for, for all of our panelists. 
um, as we come to the end here. If there is one piece of advice you could give to all of our participants today about the, their, the home stretch for success, right? What would that be? We'll do a quick round of this um, and, then, and then we'll close. So one piece of advice you could give our folks um, as they head into GOTV. Jess, could you, could you start? Yeah, um, if I can give, give two shared yes. pieces, is the first um, is to breathe. It's all gonna be okay. It's gonna be, it's going to end within however many days of election day, um, but that's all going to be okay only if you plan and prepare. So you have to plan and prepare and breathe. Um, it's all over come election day, and then you'll start again tomorrow. That's so good. I love that one. Um, Jordan. Uh, so Jess took mine, which I feel like we're of one mind. So um, I guess the other one I, I would say is it's okay to make mistakes. Like we learn from mistakes. And so um, most of them are things that we can easily recover from. Uh, you know, so just like, it's okay, try things, you know, see if it works, if it doesn't. Um, especially as we're, as we're moving into important elections in 22, 24, uh, you know, try things that you might not do, get an ad that you might not pay for normally, see what's working and, and, you know, it's okay if it doesn't quite work out. Like sometimes things don't work out when you try things. I love that. I love that. Um, is there a joy? Um, I think that the thing that I would say is just really take the time to develop your team and make sure they are well trained um, and they feel appreciated going into the final weeks. Um, also, I'm glad that Jordan brought up um, making mistakes. And I think one thing is just to like keep yourself grounded and knowing those mistakes are likely not something that will crash your entire program or campaign. Um, so like giving yourself some grace there as things don't always go as planned. Yeah, that's exactly right. That's exactly right. Yeah, I think my my piece of advice um, is to sweat the small stuff really early, right? Every day, sweat the small stuff, so that way um, you can you can kind of cruise um, towards the end. But to Jess's point, um, we need to keep people involved and we need to keep people motivated. So always thinking through the long game, right? How are people going to feel? How are people going to react to this? Um, is this good for the movement, right? Having that lens is going to make you um, just make your work and your campaign and your impact incomparable. So I think that um, thinking about your people, focusing on them and, and, and doing everything you can to support um, is really the best way to do it. Um, okay, with that, we are just coming up um, on time. So I want to thank everybody um, a ton for being here. Thank you so much to our, to our panelists, Jordan, Jess, um, and Sarah Joy, this was awesome. I learned a lot. I had a little bit of stress hearing about everybody's GOTVs, uh, but also feel better knowing that we've all got plans and that they were handled. Um, thank you to everybody who joined today for this first day. Um, I think it was a kick-ass day, if I do say so myself. Folks learned a lot, lots of great participation. I know you all um, are in for an amazing um, jam-packed week of, of campaign uh, skills and learning, and we're so excited um, that, that you all are here. So thank you for doing the work, for giving us your Saturday night. I hope you have something else uh, more exciting planned uh, after this, but um, we're so thrilled to have been with you all um, and can't thank you enough for everything you're doing. All right, y'all, we'll see you later. Hey, I'm Kelly Dietrich, the CEO and founder of the National Democratic Training Committee. For more like this, head on over to traindemocrats.org. Thanks for watching.